he will share his insights on the selection process and perhaps reveal the mysteries of what makes a successful application. Uh, he also, on a side note, just moved back to London, and I mean literally in the last 24 hours. Uh, so for him to agree to be here is a tremendous sacrifice on his part, and for that we are very grateful. Uh, but to come to think of it, he may just be ducking out on his, his unpacking duties. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to turn it over to our venue scholar, Melanie. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, when Paula asked me to speak today, I really just wanted to reiterate the fact that I am still a little bit in shock that this all happened, and by no means is my experience prescriptive, and so when I give advice, it's just, this is what I did, and I hope it works for you. I also really wanted to be very positive, so you left here with a positive note and be encouraged to apply, because I was always about eight seconds away from saying, never mind, I, this isn't going to work, so just to keep that in mind throughout my talk. I decided to apply for the Vanier Scholarship really because I felt it was going to be my only shot at funding. And I know that sounds a little weird, but because I have worked in the community for 16 years prior to coming back to do doctoral work, um, I knew it was the only place that I could really sort of talk about the nuances of those leadership experiences and what I've been doing in the community. Um, and it, you really have a lot of opportunity in this application form. It's quite a huge application to talk about all those experiences that make you who you are as a leader and who you are as a student. Um, the best advice that I received during my application was from a professor in my department who provided me with a letter of reference. And that advice was to use every opportunity, so every single form you have to fill out, um, to tell the story of your leadership, how it got you here, why you were the very best person to carry out your research project, and why that project will provide a critical insider change, and then how you will lead that change. So it has to have that trajectory, right, from the start to the finish. Um, and imposter syndrome makes this very, very difficult for the majority of us, but I just want to reiterate how important it is to keep telling your own story and to draw people into that experience who can help you tell that story. Um, I used all of the opportunities. So there's the CCV, your leadership statement, your research statement, your program of study, there's your leadership reference letter, your two reference letters, a letter from your grad chair, to sort of tell that huge, big story. And so I sat down and just sort of mapped out on a piece of paper what I wanted each one of those things to say, um, and it helped me build a big picture. The directions for the venue are very different, just so you know, from, from any of the tri council funding. Everything from the margins to the font size. So keep this in mind so you don't do as I did in a week before, find out you have half a page still to fill up. So lots of things to remember, make sure you, you read through. Um, start early, and by start early I mean have that conversation with your supervisor today. I had a conversation with my supervisor who I absolutely respect and trust, and if she had said to me, this is not a good idea, I would have listened to her. Um, but she was like, okay, let's have this conversation, let's talk a little bit more. We met a couple of times about what types of things I was doing outside of the academy, um, and that's a difficult thing to have a conversation with a supervisor, because we are always expected to sort of be fully immersed in our studies. Um, but to say to her, look, I've kind of been on this board of directors and this board of directors, and I've done this and done this, and I'm still doing this. Um, was a little bit awkward, but really important. And at that moment, she said, let's do this, let's put this forward, um, and, and really helped me with all processes. And that gave me confidence to go to my grad chair. And that's really awkward, too, because you're like, hello, nice to meet you. Please nominate me for this massive award. Um, but uh, come ready to defend and, and self-advocate. And again, this is imposter syndrome fight time, right? So you have to be like, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to do this. Um, and so I brought in a list of things I wanted to talk about with my grad chair. And so by the time I left the meeting, I had her full support, and that felt amazing. Um, she, she sort of you know, wanted to be sure that she was putting forward a student that could possibly um, win this. And so she really, she did challenge me on a few points, but I was ready for that meeting. And by the time I left, I had the department chair and the grad chairs. Okay, and once you have that, you're ready to go. Um, so then I decided to be a bit strategic about using my references, and so I gave each one of my references a copy of my CV, but I also attached a little um, blurb to each one of them, asking if each one of them could speak to different areas of leadership, because again, you're building a big picture, um, as opposed to sort of repetitive um, things. You want to make sure that each person speaks to different qualities, um, and I found that that actually really helps them prepare their letters. Um, they weren't like writing those last minute. Just so you know, though, the application for SGPS is due on September 30th, but the window for their reference letters closes 72 hours in advance. So if you want to keep a really good working relationship with your supervisor and not have her up freaking out at 11 o'clock the night before it's due, oops, 
Um, you want to just know that ahead of time. Another thing I probably should have read more thoroughly when I went through this, but it's how we got it done, but just keep that in mind. Um, and I, I think the biggest piece of advice that I got last year from this workshop was to make sure that your leadership reference letter is someone outside of academics. Um, that's not to say people don't win with academic references, I'm sure they do, but for me it was really important to get somebody who would speak to who I was as a leader as opposed to what I did as a leader. Um, and for that I sought out a couple of people to write a letter. You have the opportunity to see that letter, it's not like your other two that go into the reference of this. Um, this one you actually get to see and you have to upload yourself. And so I asked two people to be in a letter of reference and I looked at both letters and I chose the better of the two. Um, I, I really, again, it came down to, I had an amazing woman write me a one letter of reference, but it really was like a laundry list of things I'd done with the other letter of reference she talked about who I was. And that was, and what I'd done, but sort of tied that together and she was a really good writer. So we went with that one and I used that other letter of reference for something else that I was, I was looking at. So it didn't go to waste. Um, so again, who you are as a letter, uh, who you are as a leader, um, not just what you've done. Um, you know, it's, it's, it goes without saying, but edit, edit, edit. Um, I had everyone edit. If you met me in the hall last year, you edited the Vanier Scholarship for me. Um, I had just absolutely everyone go over this. And still, 24 hours after I hit submit, I opened it up, that move and found eight errors. So you really want to be like super careful that you don't get a six month stomach ache um, waiting for that letter, that little error to make the difference. Um, and also don't leave your CC beef to the last minute. The CCV is really frustrating for people who have worked outside of academics because it does not allow you to talk about the things that you've done outside of academia. It lets you name them, it lets you name the dates that you've done them, but it doesn't, if you've worked, if your work experience says, it doesn't let you describe it. You can describe 4,000 characters about a marketing position you did one time, but you can't talk about how you know, you're know you a policy advisor or anything like that. So um, I kept having to go back to my um, application and change things so that it, it was able to speak to those left references as well. Um, generally, I just tried to put together a package that was robust and that spoke to all the different um, areas of expertise that I brought and that crossed my fingers and hoped it would work. Um, after the panel is done, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I guess the only other advice I would have is that sometimes the NA scholars are hiding because we're not people that often talk about in our programs the things we do outside of academics because again, that can be frowned on. So to look in those different places, they're not always going to be the people at the top of the list when they come to mind of people who, had, um, who you would put forward for a scholarship. And be that self-advocate and go to, your, um, go to your grad chair and introduce yourself and try to say, look, I am doing all this in addition to my work. Can we go? Can we try this? It's worth it. Um, so give it your best, best shot. You never really know. And I wish you the very best of luck. Welcome. This is actually a, a really nice uh, handover to the discussion on leadership, because Melanie's already touched on some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. So one of the things that sets the Vanier competition apart from things like the CIHR and the Shirk doctoral competitions is its emphasis on leadership. That's also one of the most mysterious components of the Vanier application. It's also a component of scholarships such as the Trudeau Fellowship, and the same sort of frustrations exist there. So what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about leadership? So it's, you know, if you have the chance to talk to Melanie and others and sort of pick their brain a little bit on how they presented the leadership strengths, that I, I would suggest you do that. But just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, what in my perception are things that, that the competition is looking for, it's things that set you apart from everybody else who has really strong academic background. So basically, anybody going into the doctoral competitions for the tri-agencies are really solid academically. What the venue is looking for is how are you different from that? What are you beyond a really good academic? They're looking for potential as well as demonstration of leadership. So if you don't have a whole lot that you can already tick off as examples of leadership, but you've made some efforts to start in some areas, you've demonstrated potential, talk about those things. They're important as well. It's not just about what you've done so far, but it's what you're setting yourself up to do going forward. So 
things that you might want to think about. Think about personal achievements and, and things you've done to develop as an individual. So what have you sought out for your own personal development? What have you done to develop your own strengths, your own abilities? So things like you know, participating in professional programs or organizations. This includes sports. It includes the arts. If you've taken on leadership teams in sport or in, in the arts, that's important. Mention those. They're not necessarily looking for whether or not you did grade eight piano, but if you did and you use that to volunteer in a kid's camp, that's important. So it's what you've done with it. If you ventured out in the entrepreneurial field, talk about that. And it's not just about success, it's about effort. When I uh, was reviewing for the Trudeau Fellowship, some of the most intriguing leadership letters I read were ones that talked about their efforts where they failed. So where they thought they had a great idea for something, they got out there, they tried it, and it just didn't work out. But then they talked about what they learned from it and how that's going to help them going forward. That demonstrated that they've got considerable leadership potential and, and capability because not only did they have the strength to try something, but they learned from it and they could see where it would take them going forward. Things like foreign study, foreign travel, if as an undergrad you took opportunity to do an exchange program, talk about that, but don't just list it, talk about how it affected your development as an individual, how it may have informed your career choices, your, your study choices going forward. Keep in mind that when we're talking about leadership achievements, it's not just that laundry list. As Melanie said, don't just list things, talk about how they're important. One of the the strongest leadership letters I saw when I was doing Trudeau reviews was one that came from an applicant who talked about how they had left home as a very young adolescent, lived on the streets for a number of years, engaged in a lot of really you know, unfortunate behavior and activity, wound up with a criminal record, and then at some point decided that, you know what, they were gonna pick themselves up, they were gonna make something of their lives. They put themselves through university at the undergrad level on the basis of bursaries, scholarships, etc., and was now studying at the doctoral level in an area that basically was looking at policy with respect to social support for adolescents. Reading that story was, I mean, I admit that I sat there with tears running down my face, but what I got from that was that this is somebody who did not succeed early on and decided that they were going to use that to make something of their experience going forward. That was probably one of the most powerful leadership letters I've ever read, and it talked about failure more than it talked about success. So keep that in mind. It's not just all the really awesome things you've done, but it's the things that you've tried that have shaped you going forward. Other things that, um, that are typical that you would include in the, in the leadership component are things like your involvement in academic life, but go beyond the academics. So I've seen letters where students have said, well, you know, I, I put together a journal club where we met every week and, you know, with a group of students, we read some really cool articles, we talked about where this might go in our discipline. That's great, but you know, that's not good enough. Like, talk about how that's really going to, how that's changed you or how that's changed somebody else in that journal group. What have you done with that opportunity? Um, if you have sat on university committees, if you've had the opportunity to be engaged in undergraduate student government or graduate student government, if you've sat on senate committees, department committees, these are all really important things to know. If you've been involved in any sort of professional societies, if you've had a hand in organizing a conference, a student conference or a professional uh, association con conference, talk about that. Volunteer work. Any volunteer work that you've done in the community is important to talk about. And talk about it from the perspective of the impact that it had on you as an individual and the impact that it had on those that you worked with or the community that you worked with. Civic engagement, any political activity or engagement that you've had, um, if you've worked, if you've had the opportunity to work if, you know, with any sort of parliament or uh, political party, if you've held any sort of elected positions, mention that. 
Probably the most important thing to think about when you're framing all of this is the, the point that Melanie made. Don't create a laundry list. What you really want to talk about are those things that have shaped you as an individual and ways that you've demonstrated that you have the ability to make an impact either on your discipline, on other individuals, on your community, whether it's your social community or the academic community, but ways in which you have learned from opportunities and you are giving back. So things that you might want to think about are how, how various activities or achievements influenced you. So if you did study abroad, think about how did that impact you as an individual? What did you learn beyond the academics from that situation? How did the things that you've engaged in affect others? Do you have any evidence or any demonstration that you can talk about about how others felt that they were impacted by the work that you've done? A piece of advice when you're trying to frame all of this is sit down and have somebody who knows you well walk you through this. One of the things that we are really not good at as academics, and this goes you know, from probably, you know, elementary school all the way through the PhD program is we're not really good about boasting about ourselves. You know, whether we you know, frame it around imposter syndrome or just the fact that as academics we tend to be a more modest bunch, we're not good at saying the things that we've achieved and talking about those in a rather boastful way. And that's kind of what this application process requires. So get somebody who knows you well to sit down with you and say, okay, tell me what's good about me. What have I done? What are some of the cool things that you think that I've achieved? We tend not to be able to really look at ourselves very objectively and identify those things. I recently uh, sat down with my 17-year-old daughter who was filling out an application form and it had that leadership section on it. And she literally went, oh God. She says, Mom, I can't do this. Just forget it. I'm not even going to bother. And she put it aside. And I said, what's the matter? She said, it's asking for leadership. She goes, I can't. I have nothing to put in that box. You know, like I laughed at her and I said, you've got nothing to put in that box. She says, yeah, nothing. I have done nothing that I could call leadership. And I said, okay, okay. I said, so what about the fact that you volunteer with a couple of community art groups where you've donated your artwork for the Cancer Society, for fundraisers? What about the fact that the Cancer Society calls you every time they have a fundraiser and you're their guitar player? What about the fact that you have played guitar on a volunteer basis for a whole bunch of community art gallery openings? Oh, she says, that's that the kind of stuff they're looking for? I said, yes, that's the kind of stuff they're looking for, ways in which you've supported your community. So these are the things that we often aren't good about identifying about ourselves, but if you've got somebody else who can walk you through it, that's often what it takes to open the door for you to kind of go, oh, you know what, I do have stuff I can talk about. Allow time for review. This is really, really important. It's really important that you write this section well. I think you need to go into this competition expecting that everybody else who's applying has really excellent academics. You need to shine on this piece. So allow time for a lot of review and a lot of feedback. So we didn't exactly plan it this way, but it's really working out very well because I would also, I would like to actually uh, pick up on what uh, Melanie and Linda had said and I want to specifically pick up because it actually very much uh, parallels what I'm saying in terms of your letters of reference. And uh, so my first line was, take an active role in this process. So that fits very nicely with if you're feeling like you have imposter syndrome, shake it off. Because if you're thinking about applying for the Vanier, that you don't, you don't need it. In fact, if you're in graduate school, there is no need to have imposter syndrome. Right away, it's gone. It's not relevant. It's just a story that you just stop on, on the tape deck. And boasting is something that is really good to get used to. <laughs> So it's time, this is an opportunity to feel comfortable with boasting about yourself. Then the strategy, in my opinion, is very good. If you're, if you're thinking, I don't even know where to start, my head is all in a flurry and I need to sort out, you know, my feelings about can I do this, pick somebody you trust, 
because what you need to do is you do, and this is really supporting what Melanie actually did, you re really best practice is to sit down and put you, your character, your accomplishments, your dreams, your goals, how you're going to make a difference, all of the things that you have done, down on paper in some sort of sense that makes sense. And, and get into the flow, you know, where you can elaborate on it, where you can say yes, and feel your passion kind of start flowing through your blood, because that's why you've done all of this, because there's passion in there. And you want to get that down so that you can look at that and say, wow, this is me. And, and I'm, I stand a good chance at this. Because that then puts you in good stead to walk in the door of your department and say, hello, grad chair, nice to meet you. Or, you know, we've had some chats, but not a lot. But I would like to apply for the Vanier. There's no right or wrong who you do first, who you do second. Everybody has a different relationship in their department. You might start with your supervisor. You might start with, uh, um, with the grad chair. You might know the chair. But open the door to somebody and say, this is what I'm thinking about. And then, uh, and then think about who your letters of reference should be. And think about this as a group, your re who your referee should be. And think about this as a group of people who together are going to create uh, depictions of you through their letters that are actually going to paint a picture for the committee of who you are. Because there is no interview. And so you're not able to let them see you through your voice and how you, how you present yourself in an interview. So that's why it's really important to take an active role in the picking the referees and, and the process that they are going to use to write your letters. So a secret about professors, they don't know everything. <laughs> and they might not know anything about the Vanier Scholarship. Even though it's this huge scholarship and we send them tons of emails and we're all busy. So don't assume that if you come in and you want to say, I want to apply for this Vanier and they're like, well, like, what's that? That's not about you. That's really about, okay, you know, what's going on? So you really are going to be an advocate. And Melanie's story is a wonderful story about how she advocated for this and her advocacy and her enthusiasm was contagious. And so that, that's really, uh, I think we can think of that as a real best strategy. And if you're introverted and you're not great at boasting about yourself, well, think of this as an opportunity to move a little bit out of your comfort zone. Because if you're thinking about it, it it's, there's probably very good reason for you to be applying for it. Now, the other part of giving, being active, which is actually what Melanie had done, is give your, don't assume your referees have all the material they need to write your letters. So don't be shy about giving them information, and don't be shy about checking in with them and saying, is there anything more that you need? What else can I give you? Can I meet with you? Can, can I uh, talk to you about what, you know, what you might be, where, the approach you're going to take? You're my supervisor. You know my research inside out. But my other referee, is on my committee and is not completely up to date on what I'm doing. So, I, so I'm going to go and talk to them. Maybe you two can talk to each other. And in fact, what we're recommending is that that there's there is more of an active involvement among the people who are working, who are your referees, to talk back and forth about what's in the letter. And that's and that's something that's very helpful. And you can actually suggest that. Talk to your grad chair. Do we have do we have a selection committee or could could we actually put something together to help support this application? And we'll be suggesting that too, so just, just so you know. So the reference letters ideally fit together uh, to paint a picture of, that shows that why you're an excellent candidate to be the Vanier Scholar. When you're looking through what kind of information should I give them, Linda has already ex explained a lot about the leadership, but, but don't, um, don't forget to look at your academic accomplishments, and just because they're your, it's your supervisor or professor that they know everything. So your transcript could have some courses that are outside of the department. And there could be a grade on there that say is an 85 and your other grades are in the 90s, but it's in a social science program. 
you might know that you got the top grade, but they might not know that. So you can, you can actually talk about your transcript in case there's things on there you want them to know, or maybe your last university wasn't from Canada. And so how can you explain how actually wonderful that is if, and if in case they don't re realize they knew it was wonderful to get in, but there's anything extra that you want to tell them. You could have awards and distinctions that, wow, look at this blah, 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 blah award, but they might not be familiar with that award. Maybe you don't have on your CV just how rare it is to get that award. So tell them those kinds of things. And don't assume that your academic excellence happens only within the university. And in fact, if you read carefully the instructions around the academic excellence side to your referees, it actually says in there that they can include academic excellence results that happen outside of the university, but it's not likely they're going to know about them unless you tell them. So this is why I want to reinforce the notion that start early, be very thoughtful, and construct all of these, this information into a, a um, picture that conveys who you are. In terms of research, I've read many letters of reference. And I've met, read many student um, summaries of their work that were very good at saying what they've done. They wrote this paper and they did this, this, and this. And summarizing in general, they found blah, blah, blah. But we're not as good at saying, oh, you know, this is a contribution. This finding is a contribution because. And this finding is going to lead, has, has led to this other publication or this research group picking up on this. And so we tend to know that informally, and, and, but we don't think, oh yeah, this is what we have to put in there. So how has the research made a difference? Informed policy applied to the real world, informed another, another study, and be very active in what your research has found. I'm not going to say very much about leadership because it's already been done so well, but I just want to reinforce that in terms of your, uh, of your letters and the leadership part, the key, another way of saying what's already been said around leadership is to think kind of in the Rhodes terms. What's the contribution you want to make in the world? What's the fight you want to fight? What's the impact that you want to have? And don't be afraid to put that down in a sentence and then show all the things that have led up to that and, and how this scholarship and what you're doing right now is going to lead to that. Because that will set you apart. And I believe it's in, inside of each one of you. It's just a matter of getting it out and articulating it. Pitfalls of letters of reference, just to summarize, letters of reference that don't say enough. Letters of reference that don't give concrete details that back up claims of excellence, that back up wonderful leadership, you know, praise and research potential. So that's really important. And you might assume that, they, that your supervisor or your other referee or the leadership um, referee will know that. But again, give them the information, be willing to sit down and talk to them about it. Letters of reference that don't convey an enthusiasm. We, the letters of reference ideally will convey an enthusiasm. My sense is that, 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 that you're not solely responsible for the enthusiasm in the letter of reference, but, but you are a player in conveying the enthusiasm. So don't be shy about it. And, um, and that letters of reference that don't talk about how the candidate goes beyond expect what's expected. So, so when you're looking at what you have done and you're going to do, think in terms of, well, where was this beyond sort of the basic bar? And then articulate that to the people who are writing your letters. And if you're feeling shy, you can start by saying, you know, SGPS that I'm supposed to do this. You know, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm actually doing well. I'm excelling at, at giving you the information you need. So, yeah, if, if that makes it more comfortable. So, those are all my pearls. I hope some of them are, are wise. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to pick up some of these themes and perhaps pick up a few others as well. So, first of all, 
you, it is important to remember that you're one of a very select group of people, and spending a lot of time talking about your transcript, I wouldn't waste my time doing that. Let the transcript speak for itself. But if you had a rough first year, for example, and everything's been uphill since then, draw that to people's attention, although that is something people will notice. There are about 15 or 16 committee members, three of whom will be assigned your application. And they'll be asked to assess your application on the grounds of your academic performance, that's your transcripts basically, it's going to be what you've already done in research, but the proposal that you're putting forward and why that's important. And then the other element that we've heard a lot about is leadership. Members of the committee are asked to submit their pre-scores for each of you. They have to score each of you on each of the criteria. And the pre-scores are used to establish a ranking of all of the applications that are being considered. That's usually about 60 to 80, depending on which committee and which year. The top 10% or 15% are not discussed further, and the bottom 10 or 15 percent aren't discussed further. The really important thing to remember is that when it gets to the discussion, the committee member is not bound by the score they submitted before. They have to use a forced distribution. The scores are from zero to nine. They only are allowed to use one or two nines. The effort is to spread the, the ranking out so that you focus attention on what's important. Now that's important for two reasons. First of all, it tells you how important it is to make sure you've got a good package together, but also at the end, for better or for worse, people can see their rankings and if you see you've got one, you think, my God, what do you mean one? Well, it's not an absolute one, it's one relative to a whole pile of things that you won't even see. If I were you, unless you've got a really strong stomach, I wouldn't even look at the rankings because I don't think it'll tell you anything. <coughs> when you're writing your application, remember that the people that are reading it are not experts in your field. So make sure that you make it very clear what your research is and why it's important and why you're the right fit. That means, of course, not being too modest it means using the active voice and making direct statements. It means don't ever apologize. Unfortunately, the equipment broke down and we couldn't finish something. Don't even think of doing that, right? Because as soon as you do that, you cast doubt on your application and it becomes easy for that application to slip way down in the ranks, farther down than you want. several other things here. You'll appreciate that there's a very fine line between writing a letter or a statement that makes you sound like an arrogant person. It's better not to do that because some committee members won't be all that supportive and impressed. So it's better to make a direct short statement that's sort of modest as opposed to this is the best ever, this is the newest thing since, whatever it is. Because if you make claims that are not supported by your application, by your letters of reference, then that it will cast out on your credibility. The issue of the letters of reference is very important and it's good that the university intercedes here and, and perhaps forces people to be a little better at writing letters and being less, oh, well, this is all right. Well, that's not what you want to say. That's not what your letters want to say. They want to say why you're so very good. I think that it's really important for the graduate program chair or whatever you call them in your unit, be one of the people that's writing you a letter. And the reason that's important is because they know you, they know your supervisor, and they know the game in which you're playing. Asking someone who has none of that information is not necessarily a good thing. If the graduate program chair says this is one of the best students, the very best students in our program, and he, she is very wise in working with Professor so-and-so, that's enough. You don't need to say more than that. A lot of the files, the university perhaps, I'm not sure, sometimes the professor wants to spend half a page about talking about how wonderful the supervisor is and how wonderful the university is. 
Just cut that out. You don't need that. They don't need it. And it doesn't help your credibility. The difficulty is that you have to score well in all of the criteria. And you can't think that because you've done a really good job in your research proposal that that's going to trump everything else. It won't. Unfortunately, the committee members are really looking for a reason to spread their ranks out rather than they're looking for a reason to, to cluster them at the top. Think seriously about whether or not your application is premature. Would it be better for you to wait a year? Perhaps those manuscripts that are in the back of your mind might actually be on paper the following year. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is something to bear in mind because you're going to be up against fairly stiff competition. Now in the answer game, which is the one I'm accustomed to, if you haven't published anything at all, your application is probably premature because the best indication that someone's going to be engaged in the research game is the fact that they've already published, they know what it means to publish, and they're actively doing it. So keep that in mind. Barely you have time now to sort out a productivity problem given the deadline of when they're due. But remember, a submitted paper is a good thing to talk about. Don't ever mention in preparation. In preparation can just be a gleam in your eye, and it doesn't necessarily convince anyone at all. The issue of leadership is really fascinating. What I would do if I were you is I would start off making a statement, I have been a leader for the following reasons. Say how you're defining leadership, and then show that you are, in fact, a leader. I agree entirely about the list of all the things you've done. That's not nearly as convincing as being able to say, in my, you know, I've done these things that reflect my leadership. This has allowed me to do this. Working with science kids at a science fair, doing something else, something else. Come right out and say, that's why you're sitting out here a leader. Don't back into it. I agree entirely, get rid of the modesty, the modesty won't help you. Um, I have spent, so I guess it's five years on the committee, and I can tell you that what I've seen, I believe that the decisions are fair, people get a fair hearing, and it is important to remember that there's three people that are going to be central to making the decision, and you want to make sure that you convince whoever those readers are that you're the one. You can't do anything about your transcripts, so don't fret about them. You can do a lot about your research productivity, your potential for research, and you can do a lot about your leadership. I think it's a great program, although ironically, many of the people who are sitting as committee members are not entirely convinced that it would be better to give out more smaller scholarships because it would spread it. But that's not your problem. It's also not their problem. They get into it, and people really work very hard but people do get challenged. Somebody may say, this is the best application I looked at. And then the next person says, well, yeah, but you overlook this and this and this. So you have to be mindful of the fact that make sure what you write is wrong. I wish you all the best of luck, and I'd be happy to help. Okay, I'm going to open it up for questions on the floor. I'll come around. Uh, don't be shy. There is no such thing as a silly question. Thanks. Uh, uh, my name is Sasha Mendelson. I'm from medical biophysics.